Big and small, robots are a staple of science fiction. And every time you have a story where humans and robots are together, it seems like our relationship tends to go toward, mm, how would you put it, uh, adversarial, <laughs> I think. Now, uh, I know more about this topic than is probably sane or healthy. Um, I have written science fiction as an author. Thank you. <laughs> And I've, I've built robots as a, as a scientist. So I'm here to tell you today, honestly, that after everything I've seen, everything I've read, everything I've learned, I truly believe that we're never going to have to fight the robots. Come on. <laughs> I think the reality is much more interesting, because I think that we're in the process of becoming the robots. Now, we are reaching a milestone in the co-evolution of humankind and the tools that we use to survive. The definition of human is changing as technology that used to be outside of our bodies is coming inside. And I think how we deal with this fundamental shift is going to have a tremendous impact on our society for the foreseeable future. It all boils down to the interfaces that we use to work with our technology and our tools. Now, the first interfaces are the simplest and the most trustworthy. You pick up a stick with your hands and you swing it around. Uh, there's not a lot that can go wrong unless you're as uncoordinated as I am. And then there's a lot that can go wrong, as it turns out. <laughs> but technology got more complicated. Uh, the interface got less intuitive, more complex, and much harder to use. There's not a human being alive who's properly evolved to sit in front of a glowing screen, hunched over a desk, and paw at little tiny plastic keys on a keyboard. And uh, don't get me started about text messaging. Um, luckily, our technology has been evolving to become more natural, more similar to the way that we interact with each other. So uh, we can now talk to our smartphones. We can gesture at our video games. ATM machines can read our handwriting when we deposit our checks. And that's very handy. Because as social animals, we're highly evolved to interact with each other. And as it turns out, it's pretty difficult to find an interface that beats the one that we use with each other every single day of our lives. But it is possible. By going under the skin and accessing the brain directly, we can now control our tools as easily as we control our own bodies. I'm talking about neural implants. A neural implant is a device that sits on the surface of your brain and listens to electrical activity between the neurons. If necessary, it can talk to the brain by stimulating it with electrical activity of its own. Now, this is not science fiction or anything like that. Neural implants are in wide use, and they accomplish some pretty amazing tasks. So this is a cochlear implant. It allows deaf people to hear. The way it works is it collects sound from the environment with an external microphone, converts those sounds into electrical impulses, and then delivers those directly to the brain via the auditory nerve. Now, some people describe the sound of using a cochlear implant at first as something like pennies being thrown against a tin shed. But over time, patterns emerge. The sounds turn into words. Uh, over 200,000 people use cochlear implants already. Men, women, and lots of children all over the world. And if you ever want to have a good cry, Go onto the internet and find videos of children who are hearing their parents' voices for the first time. This is how scientists change lives. Uh, other neural implants can allow people who are paralyzed to communicate with the outside world. So this is Kathy Hutchinson, and she is taking a sip of coffee under her own power for the first time in 15 years since she had a stroke that left her paralyzed. She's controlling that big blue robot arm with enough dexterity to get the straw to her lips, and she's doing it by thinking about moving her real arm. Neural implants can help the blind to see. They can treat Parkinson's disease. They can recognize an epileptic seizure before it happens and prevent it. They can interface directly with your nerve endings to allow people to control uh, prosthetics using only their minds. And they can allow partially paralyzed people to walk and sometimes to complete marathons. So this is Claire Lomas. She's wearing a Rewalk motorized exoskeleton, and she's completing a London marathon. So it took her 17 days to go 26 miles, but, you know, that seems like a long time, but as it turns out, uh, she's paralyzed from the chest down. And so it doesn't seem like such a long time then. She can't wiggle a toe, 
but she can finish a marathon. Clearly, the technology is getting powerful, and it's getting more and more powerful. So you got to wonder, who's going to get it? You might think it's going to go to wealthy families so that they can <laughs> help their kids, or wealthy butlers, so that they can help their kids to uh, excel in school and sports. But I'm sorry, Richie Rich, you're not going to be getting the technology immediately. Uh, and I, apologies to Tony Stark. It's not going to go to billionaire playboys who, who want to fight crime. Um, no. This technology is going first to the people who need it most. That's because you don't have a hole drilled in your skull and an implant placed on the surface of your brain unless there's a serious upside. So some of the most powerful technology ever built is going to go to some of the most vulnerable and challenged people in our society. And the results of this, the consequences, are really kind of fascinating. This is Oscar Pistorius. So, because Oscar doesn't have legs below the knee, he can't run as fast as an average person. Instead, he runs as fast as an Olympian. Using, <laughs> che using cheetah blade foot modules, uh, he competed against able-bodied athletes in the 2012 uh, Summer Olympics. And his neural, his uh, prosthetic limbs do not use neural implants, but other versions do, and future versions certainly will. So, in the past, the goal of medical technology was to help people with disabilities reach a normal level of function. But normal is just a point on a graph. Through training and evolution, normal people run a little bit faster every few years. We break our old records by a tenth of a second, and when that becomes too hard, we just start breaking them by a hundredth of a second. But technology evolves faster than people. So when our grandparents were children, if you had a serious disability, you were doomed to a life that was going to be hard at best. And if you were very lucky and you had access to the most advanced technology, you could aspire to lead a life that bordered on normal. Well, things are different now. People like Oscar Pistorius are using technology to leapfrog beyond what's normal. Something unprecedented in human history is happening. Our technology is solving our problems, and then some. People who had disabilities are becoming people who have super abilities. So remember that neural implant that could recognize if you were about to have a seizure? Well, it could recognize other things, too. For instance, it could recognize if you were distracted. Anybody? <laughs> In response, it could stimulate the brain toward a state of focused concentration. So a user with this sort of neural implant could focus 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and all the while the implant would be strengthening the neural circuits associated with concentration. And it's not just mental tasks. A potential neural implant like this in the future could also recognize <laughs> practice movements, any sort of practice movement, and in response, it could stimulate the area of the brain associated with that physical task. So the first users would be people who had had strokes and were learning how to walk again. But later on down the line, it would be quite easy to perfect your golf swing or hone that all-important cat juggling skill. <laughs> Brains and brawn. And all you have to do to get this is allow the technology under your skin. <laughs> But <laughs> I love doing that to you. But what about the unforeseen consequences? What about the strains put on society uh, with the creation of a new class of super-abled person? So what happens when mentally sharp, physically capable retirees return to the workforce by the millions? What happens when your daughter is the only one in her class who does not have a neural implant and she has the lowest test scores to prove it? Do you put her under the knife? Do professional sports teams allow people who've trained with neural implants to compete? They allowed Oscar Pistorius to, but will they allow him in four years? Would you elect a person with a neural implant to office? Would you hire one if they could do the job faster? And if you had a neural implant, should you be forced to disclose that information to other people, or is that just going to open the door to discrimination? We're reaching a real milestone. We've been co-evolving with our technology for over 200,000 years. Together, we've been on a generation-spanning journey through the ages. And it's culminating right now in our lifetime. So just think about this. 200,000 years of modern humans, prehistory, generation after generation. And we are lucky enough to be alive right now at this moment, the first moment that our tools are ready to come inside our bodies and become a part of us.
This is going to change the world. The question is, how could you change it for the better? What diseases could you erase? What new abilities could you create? Ask yourself, what gifts could you give to the human race? Thank you.